correct? Okay. So welcome everyone. Today our speaker is Marco Cattaneo. Most of you know him. He is a PhD here at IFISC. He got his PhD in 2018 in the University of Milan, Università di Studi di Milano, under the supervision of Matteo Paris and Sabrina Maniscalco with the work on um, quantum walks and search algorithms. And then in 2019, he started to work with us at IFISC um, to his PhD work on uh, open quantum systems. And if you are successful with the Cotutel, he should be able to uh, complete his joint PhD between the IFISC and the University of Helsinki, where the supervisor is Sabrina Maniscalco. So from last year, he's actually physically there. And today he's going to present uh, his recent uh, uh, work. And I think now you could share the screen, Marco. Can you see the presentation? Yes. So today is going to present this work on benchmarking experimental quantum computation uh, uh, with a rigorous analysis in the simulation of dissipative collective systems. And it is a pleasure to, to, to have you virtually here. And uh, he will be actually be also visiting us uh, soon. So if uh, any question arises, we will have, apart from this occasion, also soon an occasion to have other meetings with Marco here. So please. Okay, so hi everybody, and um, as Roberta was saying, this is going to be also my final EFISC uh, seminar of the PhD, because if everything goes smooth, I will defend uh, the PhD in December. And uh, actually, the work I will present now is also like probably the final project of my PhD thesis, and it's also the only experimental work I've done during the PhD. And of course, I, I didn't go actually in the lab like to, to do the experiment. Uh, this is experimental because we, we have a collaboration with IBM Quantum Computer. And uh, so we, the, the experiment we have done was actually performed by IBM, as I will explain you in this talk. And of course, um, the talk will, will not be technical. At least the, most of the talk will, won't be technical. Uh, there are some parts which are, which, which are more technical, but I will just warn you about them when, uh, when they will come. But just uh, stop me and uh, ask me any questions during the talk also, if you have curiosities or doubts or uh, anything. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation. So I will, first of all, talk about open quantum system simulation because the experiment we have done is actually about the simulation, the quantum simulation of a open quantum system, which is multipartite. That is to say, it is made by multiple subsystems and it's basically the topic of my PhD, uh, the study of this kind of uh, open quantum systems. So I will just broadly introduce what I mean by open quantum system simulation. Then I will present the algorithm we have used to, to perform the experiment. And then finally, I will show the experimental results and then importantly, since we are talking about an actual quantum computer, so the experiment is literally on a quantum computer, uh, but of course the quantum computers are noisy. So uh, I will also talk a lot about uh, the experimental errors we run into in a quantum simulation. Okay. So let's start with a theoretical framework of uh, open quantum systems. Uh, probably uh, some of you already heard about this many times in the, in the seminar by the group of Roberta. So what we are going to talk about is a, a quantum system, this red ball here, which is open. That means that uh, it's not, uh, sorry, which means that it's not isolated. It's immersed in a bigger environment. And so it's dynamics, the time evolution of this quantum system rho s here is not described by the Schrodinger equation anymore. It's described by a more general equation, which is usually written like this because of the interaction with a bigger environment. So it's not closed anymore, right? And the dynamics uh, can be written like this. So we have a rho s, which is the density matrix of the system, the quantum density matrix. 
the time evolution is driven by this L here, which is called value billion, and it is a super operator acting on rho s. And the general structure of the master equation is this one. And this is called the gorini kosakowski sudarshan limblad master equation or a GKLS master equation. And more specifically, this master equation is the most general Markovian master equation for an open quantum system. So there are no memory effects in the, in the time evolution of the, of the quantum system. And indeed, you can see that the, 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 the dynamics of the state of the system at time t can be described as this uh, exponential of um, the Levillian superoperator times the time applied on the state of the system uh, at the initial time. And so you see that this operator here has the structure of a semigroup. What does it mean? It means that uh, if you do an evolution from t0 to t1, and then from t1 to another time t2, this is equal to the evolution from t0 to t2. Basically, we lose track of the intermediate step, time steps, right? And this is why it's Markovian. And the form of this master equation is quite nice. It's quite elegant because here you find a unitary dynamics here. And this is exactly mm, the Schrodinger equation for uh, the density matrix of a closed system. So um, this is called actually the von Neumann equation. But if, if you write down the density matrix as a uh, bras and cats, basically this part here is just the standard Schrodinger equation. And the fact that we have a, a, an environment coupled to the, to the open system can be seen here in this part, which is called the, the dissipator. So this part here is generating the dissipative dynamics with some decay rates here, these gammas, and then some jump operators. Uh, what are the jump operators? Mm, let's say that naively you can think of them as uh, those operators uh, who are creating uh, the, the excitation, the dissipative excitation or emissions in the system. For instance, if your open quantum system is just a qubit uh, with uh, or a quantum spin, so spin up and spin down, then a dissipative environment uh, has a jump operator which is equal to sigma minus. So the operator which is just making the qubit decay from spin up to spin down. Okay, so. This is the generic dynamics we are interested in. We want to simulate these dynamics. And actually, we want to simulate it for an open quantum system, which is multipartite, as I said at the beginning. And why do we want to study multipartite open quantum systems? Well, because the general idea is to see them as a quantum network, right? So with uh, multiple subsystems, which are the nodes, and then the connection between them um, which are links uh, driven by some interaction between the subsystems, and then to see what happens when we put an environment. So to be able to study general, general quantum networks in dissipative environments, of course, we have to develop a theory about them. And this is what I've done during my PhD, basically. So I have said I want to perform the quantum simulation of this system, of this open quantum system. And maybe many of you can just ask me, but why? why? Why do I want to do this, uh, this kind of simulation? What is the meaning of, uh, of uh, doing some research about this? So I will just provide some motivation why we are interested in this. And the, the, the fact is that mm, the old tra the traditional vision about the environment uh, is that the environment is the enemy. So it's something we have to avoid uh, and uh, we want to try to keep it away. And why so? Well. Basically, because in a quantum computer, the environment, the, the external environment, uh, if rho s is our quantum computer, this external environment is responsible for the loss of coherence in our system. And this is actually why uh, quantum computers are not on the market nowadays, okay? because it's difficult to make a quantum computers which are, um, let's say, precise enough without so much interaction with the environment so that they can preserve coherences, quantum coherences. And if they don't preserve quantum coherences because of the environment, then you, you cannot perform quantum computation anymore. But 
now in my PhD or, uh, in, or, or also in this talk, the, the vision is a, is a bit different. The vision is that the environment is our friend, we are interested in it, and that we want to engineer it. Why so? Well, for a number of reasons. Maybe the first one that comes to mind is uh, the fact that there is this very well-known result in 2009 about the fact that if you are able to engineer any possible uh, environment on a, on a quantum system, so basically if you are able to build a any possible GKLS master equation I have presented before, then you, you have a model of quantum computation. So you have a model for a universal computation. That means that you can solve any task you, you may be interested in. And it's also quantum. So it has quantum advantage exactly as standard quantum computation. How do you do so? Well, basically you prepare, you, you, let's say any GKLS master equation as a steady state. And the idea is that you can engineer a steady state that is the result of the task you're interested in. So you drive the evolution toward the steady state and you find the result. But this is maybe not even the most important reason why we, we might be interested in engineering a general environment, a general GKLS master equation. For instance, uh, this is uh, something very important for quantum thermodynamics. So the study of thermodynamics uh, in, in, on quantum systems and uh, also on individual quantum systems. So on a single spin immersed in a buff or uh, between two buffs. To do so and to do so experimentally to find some results on quantum thermodynamics, then it's very important to engineer a, a general environment. For instance, you can you can imagine to try to test experimentally the quantum Landauer principle by engineering the environment. So you engineer an environment and then you compute the change of entropy, information, the exchange of heat and so on and so forth. And you, you try to find some experimental evidence about the Landauer principle in quantum system. Then yet another reason is the fight against uncontrollable environments. So um, you, the idea is that you can overlap your engineered environment on the standard incoherent environment to try to build the so-called decoherence-free subspaces. So some subspaces where the dynamics is not dissipative anymore. And finally, the, maybe the most interesting uh, reason for a FISC is the fact that if we are able to engineer experimentally uh, collective uh, environments, so environments uh, and GKLS master equations for multipartite open quantum systems, then we can study collective phenomena, which is also um, part of the topic of my talk today. What I mean by collective coherent phenomena, um, for instance, quantum synchronization that Roberta and Gianluca have been studying for uh, some years now, we like the emergence of a collective phenomena uh, on, on, in quantum systems, or also, for instance, the study of uh, dissipative quantum phase transitions, which is uh, getting more and more uh, interesting in the recent years. So to do so, we indeed need to be able to simulate uh, a generic GKLS master equation. And now what I want to do before getting to the point of my talk, so getting to, to my results, is to talk about about uh, talk a bit about quantum simulation because maybe some of you don't know what exactly quantum simulation is. Uh, I actually already used these uh, these slides last year for the seminar, so perhaps some of you already have seen this. But just to to, to give a broad introduction for everybody, I want to repeat this. So to talk about quantum simulation, I first w want to introduce uh, to introduce to to, to to say what I mean by classical simulation. And perhaps the best example is to think of uh, n classical spins in an easing model. So just imagine to have a 2D lattice. In this 2D lattice, we have uh, n spins and they can just be up or down, okay? And the question is, where can we write the information about the configuration of this lattice? And the more or less trivial answer is in n classical bits. You can think of each single bit being as being associated with 
a single uh, spin of, of your uh, easy model. And so the information about the spin is just at zero. So spin down or up or one spin up. Okay. And you do so and you get the true to the n configurations of the lattice. But now what happens with n quantum spins? Well, now the state of the, the, state of the lattice, before it was just a, a single configuration of up or down, but now the state of the lattice is not a single configuration anymore because we have a quantum superposition. So in general, the state of our system of n quantum spins is, an eigen, is a wave function and it's a superposition of the tensor product of, uh, of, 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 of the spin of each side. So if you want, it's a superposition over all the possible configurations of our lattice. And so the information about the state is contained in the amplitude of the wave function here. Two to the n, like the, the, the space where the wave function live, lives, is not just a two to the n space of configurations, and that's all. But uh, it, it is described by two to the n complex numbers. So now, of course, you cannot use n classical bits to describe two to the n complex numbers. You need too many classical bits. And uh, as soon as n scales up, then you just cannot use uh, classical bits to describe this anymore. Maybe you can do it until, up, mm, I don't know, uh, 50 classical, uh, 50 quantum spins with on a classical computer, but then I'm not even sure that uh, true to the 50 is something accessible, but like you, you, you very soon just cannot perform, uh, not even perform computational uh, analysis, but also you cannot just store the information about this. Why am I saying all this? Well, because quantum, the idea of quantum simulation is exactly to use a system which is controllable and it's a system of quantum particles to simulate the dynamics of, for instance, the n quantum spins. And this is almost uh, trivial, you know, because you're saying if I need to simulate and to store the, inf the information about n quantum spins, then I can store it into n quantum bits, which are exactly quantum spins. So this is um, really, really trivial. But the idea is that if, if you're able to control your, your apparatus of uh, n qubits and quantum bits, then you can really see what is the outcome of the dynamics for the n quantum spins. And this is exactly the reason why quantum computers have been introduced by Feynman in 1982. And the general model of uh, a modern framework of uh, um, quantum simulators is the one introduced by Seth Lloyd in this paper in. Uh, 1996. A bit le less trivial now is to understand how we can simulate the dynamics on this controllable platform. Mm, if you have a, a Hamiltonian driving the evolution and this uh, Hamiltonian is too complex, and in particular if it's a um, long range Hamiltonian, so that means that if you just uh, extend your lattice, your Hamiltonian is getting to the end of, of the lattice for all the other spins. So the first spin or the spin in position one, one feels the spin in position n, n. Then there is just no way that you can simulate efficiently these dynamics, basically because you're adding an exponential number of interactions each time you scale up your system, right? So the idea is to reduce ourselves to the set of k local Hamiltonians. And this means that your Hamiltonian can be long range, but not, not more than k. So the maximum distance between spins feeling the interaction between each other is k. And of course, then we can scale up the system, but still k is fixed. And can, can also be fixed at um, 50 or 100. But the important thing is that if we go to 1,000, then it's still 100. And if we do so, then the idea is just to decompose the evolution. This is just the evolution given by the Schrodinger equation with the Hamiltonian. And then we decompose it into this um, pro product of k 
k local time evolutions here, which we are able to simulate uh, because uh, we are getting like uh, towards something which is more and more localized. And we can do this operation. Of course, this is not exact because the h uh, sigmas um, may not commute, but it is exact up to order delta t square. So if you choose a time step which is small enough, then you can do this efficiently. This is called the trotterization of the, of the time evolution. So this is the general idea of uh, quantum simulation. And when you put it on a quantum computer, these are the gates. For instance, these are the qubits, qubit zero, qubit one, qubit two. And you can think of performing a complex evolution with single gates, which should mimic uh, each single H sigma. And if you do so with a sufficiently small time step, then you, you recover the, the exact result or, or uh, um, the, the result up to an error which you can control. This is of course for, um, uh, for, the, for, for the quantum simulation of closed quantum systems. What we are interested in is the quantum simulation of open quantum systems. This paper is the one that introduced a more or less um, general framework from this. And the idea is basically the same. So instead of having the Hamiltonian, now the generator of the time evolution is the Levillian superoperator of the GKLS master equation, uh, the superoperator I have introduced before. And again, you have to assume that the superoperator is scale local, and then you do the trotterization and you just say, okay, the error scales well, in the sense that you just need a polynomial number of gates, not an exponential number of gates anymore, as a function of the number of subsystems, time, and inverse of a required precision. So this is the general idea of quantum simulation. And specifically of the quantum simulation we're interested in, we're interested in, in, uh, in our work. And now that we have this, what we need, for, uh, for our experiment, I uh, will discuss later on, is an algorithm, is a quantum algorithm. And actually the quantum algorithm we have used on the quantum computer is uh, uh, the algorithm uh, uh, we have uh, published uh, last year. So this in this paper here. Um, and if you are interested in the details of this, I actually gave a talk in a ethics seminar last year about this. So you can find it on YouTube. And now I will just very quickly discuss what is the algorithm. And the red screen here is just telling you that um, things will be a bit more technical now, but okay, just uh, stop me and ask me if you have doubts or anything. So what is our idea now getting like to a more concrete uh, uh, quantum system? Um, we have our open quantum system which is multipartite. So it is this network here. And if you want each green ball is a, a subsystem of our open quantum system, you can imagine for instance, that each green ball is an atom. And we want to simulate the most general uh, open system dynamics of this multipartite open quantum system. So if you want to, we can think of this as some atoms which interact between, between each other. And there is uh, the electromagnetic field acting on the atom. So they are decaying in some way, but then I will get to the experiment we have actually performed, which is more uh, like more, um, more specific. How do we simulate this, uh, this open system dynamics? The idea is the one of the so-called collision models. Since uh, on a quantum computer, of course, we do not have uh, an electromagnetic field that we can control and, and the tax directly on the on, on our open quantum system. What we can do is to try to simulate to simulate the action of this environment by means of collisions between single qubits, which we call the ancillary qubits of the environment, or ancillas, these uh, blue balls here, and these balls are just colliding with the system. They are creating some interaction, and then they go away. And the fact that they go away and we can just forget about them is what is creating a difference between the standard Schrodinger equation of this open quantum system and uh, our actual open system dynamics. So the idea of this collision model is that if you do things properly, if you make these ancillas interact in the, in the right way between, uh, between, for instance, pairs of qubits of a system, 
then you recover the most general GKLS master equation. And of course, the idea is that if you do a single interaction with an ancilla, you get what is called the quantum map, which is just the standard time evolution of the state of the system and state of the ancilla. And then you trace away the degrees of freedom of the ancilla. This trace away means you just forget about it. And this is for a single collision. You recover the generic uh, um, quantum dynamical semigroup I have discussed uh, at the beginning by making M collisions and by taking a sufficiently small time step. So of course, this is the mathematical limit in which everything is exact. Otherwise you will have some, some error which depends on the time step. But the idea is this, you just make uh, um, more collisions um, one after the other uh, against the, the open quantum system. And on a quantum computer, what you have is a structure like this one. So just imagine that one is a qubit of a quantum computer, two is another qubit of a quantum computer, and this is an ancillary qubit of a quantum computer. What you have to do is the structure of three gates. These um, boxes here are quantum gates, so quantum operations on your, uh, on your quantum computer. That means generally mm, any kind of uh, a time evolution between uh, uh, two qubits, basically. Okay, these are quantum gates. And what you have to do is this structure here, which is called the second order Suzuki trotter decomposition. It's something more involved than what I have presented before for the trotterization. And um, basically, you have your jump operators in the master equation. And these jump operators must be simulated by, um, by this gate here. So just imagine that you have, uh, for instance, this jump operator acting on system two and this jump operator acting on system one. Then what, what you have to do is to perform a gate which contains the jump operator of, of a subsystem two for a time delta t half. And then a gate uh, with the same ancillary qubit uh, with the jump operator of, of a subsystem one, which lasts for delta t, and then you repeat the gate between the ancilla and subsystem two. This is the general idea of the algorithm. And if you look into the um, into like the, the experimental procedure we have done, is exactly you, you exactly see something like this: the structure of three gates. The idea of the algorithm, the general idea of the algorithm, is that if you do so with a sufficiently large number of ancillas, you can just map all the possible jump operators in your master equation. So you just compose it like this, all these ancillary, all these collisions with an ancilla. Then you can also add some unitary system dynamics. You, you can do this using the standard uh, tools for uh, closed system quantum simulations and you recover this part here. Importantly, you have to initialize the state of the ancillas in the ground state. This is something important also for the experiment, but the ancillas must be initialized in the ground state. And finally, you do the collision, as I said, and you forget about the ancillas and you recover the, the quantum dynamical semigroup. Okay, so this is the general, um, let's say the, the general instructions uh, for, uh, for the algorithm. Now, what we have done in the experiment is something um, which follows the same uh, algorithm, but it's, if you want, the most simple thing uh, we can do, which is simulating super radiance and sub radiance between just two qubits. As always, uh, we, we discuss the general case uh, with uh, n qubits, but uh, then we, uh, so n subsystems, but then we go to just two subsystems, because the idea is that the jump, the, the conceptual uh, uh, ga gap between uh, one qubit, so a single uh, system and two subsystems is uh, larger than uh, the, the, the gap between studying only two subsystems and n subsystems. But okay, let's see if this is true. Anyway, what we have done is to simulate superradiance and subradiance between two qubits. What is superradiance and subradiance? It's, uh, they, they are very well known phenomenon uh, between, for instance, a pair of atoms, a Roche won the Nobel Prize for studying experimentally this. You have uh, two atoms and they are emitting simultaneously in the same common electromagnetic field. 
And when they do so, you can find some collective efforts, some signatures of uh, what you can call a collective effort. And uh, so when you scale up the number of atoms, when you have, uh, again, um, a dissipative phase transition and so on and so forth. So the master equation we are going to simulate is something quite simple. We just have this jump operator, which is a collective jump operator for um, the, which is basically destroying the excitation in qubit one plus, so interference, destroying the excitation in qubit two. Okay, so our quantum algorithm now is quite simple. We just have, uh, for instance, one gate for qubit one, and you see here that the jump operator appears, and this is the the equivalent uh, operator for the state of uh, for the ancilla for the ancillary qubit. And then you have a, a, the same analogous, analogous gate for, uh, for the qubit two, and then you just merge them in this way. Then you have to initialize the state of the ancilla in the ground state. And as I said before, you perform the time evolution and you forget about the state of the ancilla. And it can be shown that in the right limit, you are simulating super radiance and sub radiance. Physically, what does it mean to, to do so? Um, what I'm plotting here as a function of time is the emission of a system of two qubits, of two atoms, if you want. What is the emission is literally like the light you see, the burst of light you see for the emission into the electromagnetic field, for instance. So it's the energy we are losing, the power, so, sorry, it's the emission power. So it's the energy we are losing in a certain time. And uh, um, just uh, to compare what happens without super radiance and what happens with super radiance, I have plotted also the local decay. So the case of two qubits, which are decaying into separate uh, environments. So there is no collective effort at all, okay? And um, in this case, you see that the emission power starts at one because of course they, they have, uh, uh, in general, well, okay, here they are starting from, uh, a bell state, so an entangled state, and uh, they have some energy and they start losing the energy because, mm, because they have it and there is the electromagnetic field. And it goes like a standard exponential, okay, like this. When we have super radiance and we start from the so-called super radiance state, uh, which is a different bell state, then what we see is a way more rapid decay, okay? So it's a more intense burst of energy. And this is actually due to the fact that there is a collective phenomenon acting there. There is, um, the, the atoms are emitting and creating some um, positive interference in the mission. So this is what we expect when, we, what we expect when we simulate super radiance. Sub radiance means that we start from a different bell state but due to the fact that we have, again, a system which is collective, so there, there is some collective phenomenon, um, if we have super radiance, so there is a mode which is decaying very rapidly, then we also have a mode which is not decaying at all. It's one of the decoherence free subspaces I have mentioned before. So if you have sub radiance, sub -radiance you, you just don't see emission at all. If you observe the atoms, you don't see light at all, but due to the emission into the, into the electromagnetic field. And then you can also study the decay of uh, uh, what happens when we, when we have uh, both qubits in the excited state. So it's not an entangled state anymore. And you see that again, we have uh, some rapid, rapid emission, but it's not such intense as for the su super radiant state. Okay, so this is what we want to simulate. Okay, so now some words about the experimental platform. As I said, this is an experimental work, but I didn't perform the experiment because um, what we can perform the experiment on the cloud. There is a service which is called uh, IBM Quantum Experience, I think, but they change the name quite often, so I'm not sure now. And you can uh, access yourself to the page of IBM. IBM has some real quantum computers in the labs. In, they are mostly in the US, I think. 
and the idea is that they allow researchers uh, through some kind of uh, convention to get access to this um, to these quantum computers and what I can do here in my personal page of IBM quantum experience is that I can really build a quantum circuit so here I'm just performing quantum operations so time evolutions between the qubits qubit one qubit two qubit one uh, qubit zero qubit one qubit two and I can add more qubits so I'm adding quantum gates there is also a code which is describing the circuit and uh, I have also the, the simulation of uh, what is happening. Of course, this is classical simulation so far. Um, and of course, this uh, breaks down when I add some qubits. If I get to 12 qubits, this is just too slow, for instance. And I can just then send the circuits to the real quantum computer, and they are really performing the experiment. And I get the results from the actual uh, experimental quantum computation. And what, can, what I can do is also to access different uh, quantum computers. Um, with Roberta, we, we have um, a um, convention through FASIC. So we have access to some uh, advanced quantum computers. For instance, here I can use a, a quantum computer with 127 qubits. So this is the biggest quantum computer in the world so far. And what is happening then? is that I send these codes, I get the result, and I'm actually performing an experiment. The drawback is that, of course, this is not something which is, uh, let's say, optimized in the lab. So the results are noisy, typically. The quantum computer is something fancy like this, but actually the actual computation is performed on a chip, which is here. And uh, what we have used is a quantum computer, which is called IBM Q Guadalupe. And it has uh, uh, 16 qubits. And to show you, this is the topology of the quantum computer. So each ball is a qubit. And each link means that you can perform a direct gate between this kind of, with these two qubits, OK? For my experiment, for simulating super radiance and sub radiance, I have chosen uh, uh, qubit 0 and 2 of Guadalupe as the system qubits. These are the two atoms emitting coherently. And then I said, I, I want to perform a collision model. I want to simulate the collision model as a, as a quantum algorithm. And these green qubits here are the qubits I've chosen as ancillary qubits. And to collide with the state of the systems, I just have to swap them every time. So first I use one as an ancilla, then I swap one and four, and I use, and I use four as a, an additional ancilla for an additional collision and so on and so forth, okay? So finally, just to show you the experimental results. Um, as I said, you don't have to expect results which are perfect as in standard experiments or <laughs> let's say um, in, in a controlled labor laboratory, right? But anyway, we can see from these results, what I'm plotting here is the number of collisions. And this is the probability of getting the um, um, what is what are called the populations of the two qubits. So basically, what is the probability of finding the qubits in the ground state, the ground ground state, or first qubit ground, second excited, or first excited, second ground, or excited, excited. So basically, I'm reconstructing the wave function, or at least the populations of the density matrix. And the solid lines are the theoretical predictions for our two qubit system. And uh, the dash dot lines are the experimental results. So what we can observe is that apart from this case, where there is an error which is clearly due to the preparation of the state of the, uh, of the systems, because you see there is a, a systematic error if you want everything is shipped down of some value and probably this is due to the preparation. But you see that otherwise the scaling of our of our experimental um, lines is actually more or less respecting the theoretical scaling. And what I mean by this is that you see here the different uh, states I'm studying, for instance, the subradiant state. Of course, the subradiant state is the one which has more noise because it should stay stable, no emission at all. But we see that there is some emission. 
and this is because of the noise in the system and it's also why it is more sensitive to noise because it's the most fragile one right you want something which doesn't evolve at all but every little interaction with some external environment uh, makes it move and so you you see this but then for instance you you can actually see that the super radiant state is decaying very rapidly even here even this is a very there is this systematic error but you see that the scaling is very rapid and the same here and the same for the excited excited state and importantly you see that the local decay this is uh, uh, what I said when I, I have also simulated the dynamics when there is only there are two environments so there is local decay we don't see coherent effects anymore so you see that the important thing the, the important result if you want is that the sub radiant state is actually decaying more rapidly than the local incoherent state which is the theoretical difference between collective and incoherent and at the same time the sub radiant state is decaying um, more slowly than the local state. So in this sense, we, we were actually successful in simulating signatures of collective effects, right? We, we, we have shown that uh, through our algorithm, we can show a difference between the local incoherent case. And this was for one set of results, but I have actually run a lot of sets and in another case, uh, you find uh, some very crappy results. Like here, I don't have uh, a clear signature of what I've said before. So the last part of my talk, I don't have much time yet. Uh, right, Roberta? Sorry, I'm muted. You have uh, five, 10 minutes. Okay, yes. Five, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that will be fine, I think. The last part of my talk is just to discuss about the effects of noise in uh, in this uh, in these uh, devices because our um, like the idea of our work is actually to show that it's very important to perform noise analysis of this kind of uh, very um, of, uh, on this actual current quantum computers because they are noisy so it's important to understand what is happening on the device apart from getting the results and getting these signatures. So I will quickly introduce something which is very technical. So don't get scared if you, if you don't understand all the details here. What we have done in, in the paper is to compare different figures of merit for, uh, for the noise in our quantum device. And the idea is to perform the full process tomography of all the gates we have in the algorithms and to compare our experimental results of the quantum simulation with the experimental results of the noise tomography. So the general scheme is that we have some ideal gate we want to simulate this UG, and then the actual quantum operation we are actually performing on the quantum computer T. This is a quantum channel. And we can study um, the distance between these two, um, these two quantum operations with different uh, figures of merit. For instance, the one to one super operator norm is just the maximum over uh, the initial states of a trace norm of a channel applied to the states. And then importantly, we have studied the diamond norm, which is just the same, but there is an additional tensor product here with uh, a copy of the Hilbert space of the system. Why this is very important? Well, because it has this property. If you add subsystem like if you had a, mm, trivial systems you just get the same value and this is very important for, um, um, for uh, benchmarking the um, precision of your quantum computer and actually what we are interested in is just this distance between the ideal gate and the quantum channel then we have the average gate fidelity which is just a, an average quantity of the fidelity an average quantity over the initial states of the fidelity between applying the gate to the initial state and the quantum channel. And this is something which we have done through full process tomography, but usually it, it is estimated through some, let's say, heuristic procedure, which is called randomized benchmarking. And IBM uses this to, 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 to give uh, their values of the error for the gates. And finally, we have also the unitarity, just Mm, it's not important the um, analytical formula. The idea of the unitarity is uh, 
how incoherent is your process, is your quantum channel. If you have unitarity one, then it means uh, that you have uh, a fully uh, unitary evolution, like uh, the Schrodinger equation. If you have a uh, very low in unitarity, it means that you have a lot of dissipation in your quantum channel T. Okay, so these are the tools we have used. What we have done in the paper, first, I will go fast, I think. Analytically, we had a previous bound for the, for the error. We, this was uh, found in the PRL, in the paper, in the theoretical paper of last year. And what we have done in this paper is just to show that to this bound, you have to add a new bound due to the fact that you're using noisy gates. And this bound is indeed given by the sum of the errors between your ideal gate and the noisy gate, plus the sum of the errors between ideal ancillary qubit preparation in the ground state and noisy ancillary qubit preparation. So this is fun, something theoretical you can find in the paper. And then importantly, and this is the last thing of my talk, we have studied experimentally these values, okay, on our quantum computer. So what you can find here is the gates, the synod gates between pairs of qubits in our quantum computer. And I'm plotting, for instance, uh, how uh, unitary is uh, our gate. What is the gate error given by IBM? So the one given by randomized benchmarking, this um, purple uh, line here, and then our value of average gate infidelity, and also the diamond distance here, just forget about uh, the upper bound, this uh, blue line. And just to make you understand, uh, I recall this is the topology. So you see zero, one, qubit zero, qubit one, qubit one, qubit two. These are the, just the gates between those qubits, okay? So what we notice is, first of all, that the diamond distance, as I said, is the distance for uh, um, benchmarking quantum fault tolerant computation. That is to say, um, how far are we from real quantum advantage? And the idea is that if you get uh, to a diamond distance, which is of the order of 10 to the minus three, then you can start claiming quantum advantage and you can start saying that you have uh, quantum computers that can really um, change the world, let's say. But we can see that our experimental values, and these were not, let's say, known before, are more of the order of 10 to the minus one. So we are still far away from that threshold. And as for the average gate of infidelity, or fidelity if you want, we see that there is some discrepancy between our value, our experimental value, and the nominal value through randomized benchmarking. So this is the first result. And the other result is that the, um, our gates have, uh, let's say, the more noisy they are, you see, the higher this uh, bar here, this orange bar, the less unitary they are. So the idea is that the noise in our system is fully dissipative. It's due to dissipation, basically, and not to some coherent noise uh, that we have in our system. Um, okay, so let me, okay, this is just the scaling of the noise as a function of the number of gates, but I will just keep this because I don't have time. And what I want to show is the discrepancy with the second set of results. You remember the very, very noisy set of results I've shown before. And the fact is that we have shown that this was very noisy because there was a gate here and IBM was claiming that this gate was good or relatively good, but we found that the experimental process tomography is very high. So the average gate infidelity here is very high. And so this means that our full process tomography is, uh, let, let's say, sh shedding light on, uh, on a gate which is not properly working on the system. And this is why we were just getting crappy results, okay? So this is, if you want, is one of the major uh, results of, uh, of our work. And again, the, um, the scaling of the number of gates uh, is similar to the one we found before, but the big difference is this gate. So I will summarize, I five minutes late, I think. Um, so what we have done in this work, what we have some, what we have shown in this work, first that dissipative collective effects can be non-trivially simulated on current quantum computers, so you can find signatures of collective effects there. 
And then the important claim of, of our work is that experimental noise analysis is crucial to understand what is happening on this uh, um, current quantum computers, which are noisy. Are, they are universal, you can do whatever you want, but they are noisy. So you need to perform this full process tomography to understand what is, what is happening there. And for instance, the standard heuristic randomized benchmarking procedure is not reliable in general in the practice as we've shown. And the other major result, or experimental result we have found is that the diamond norm, so the diamond distance here for full tolerant computation is still orders, orders of magnitude away from the noise tolerance threshold. And all these results are in this paper here, in this uh, archive preprint. So just to conclude, this is the team. So this is me, Matteo Rossi, here at uh, Helsinki, Guillermo Garcia Perez, here at Helsinki as well, Roberta and Sabrina Maniscalco, who is uh, my other supervisor. So thanks a lot and sorry for being a bit over time. Thank you, Marco. So thank you for the talk and it's time for questions. If there are questions from the audience, please just unmute yourself and ask now. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, it's very inspiring <laughs> because uh, I, Rosa and Raul were at, uh, thinking about doing simulation uh, of quantum water model. Mm -hmm. like a few years ago, but we didn't do it uh, somehow. But I think, yeah, it's, now it is very inspiring. So, but a critical concern for me is that, uh, so I think the ancilla should be initialized, right? Uh, yes, but uh, and, no, and, we are and, lucky because let's say, let me go back to the computer. So this is the computer. These are all the qubits and the qubits, they are usually initialized in the ground state. And in uh, our case, uh, for our algorithm, we want qubits in the ground state for the ancillas. So it's fine for us. So is there some kind of speed limit for the initializing the ancillas? Or I think there should be some uh, critical limit. What do you mean by speed limit for initializing the ancillas? You mean if we want some thermal ancillas, for instance, or? A... Sorry, there is some issue with the micro, I think. That's a, I don't know if Roberta, you are hearing the same or? I, I, I'm not hearing the question, just noise. Yes, the same. But before it was fine. Uh, can you try so, again, Sun Gwen? Yeah. Problem. So the problem, uh, 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 so if I want uh, the ancillas to be uh, like uh, spin ground state. Super robotical. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> <in the robot. laughs> I, I, I will write it down. Uh, but before it was fine, so I don't know what happened. So maybe you're trying to say what up, if you want to start uh, from a different state because the vacuum is already even by the platform, which is the limit of time to, to change the local state of the ancilla. Is this the question? Uh, okay, maybe now, maybe now. Maybe now, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. if, for example, if I if I uh, want to initialize the ancilla by putting some cold cold uh, thermal bath, then okay. there is a rate of uh, relaxation yes. to the ground state. Yes. And what will be the relaxation rate? Uh, yeah, that's my question. Th this is a, uh, it's a very good question. It's actually something we, we are thinking about. But the problem is that the way they initialize the ancillas is usually not like that. It's not like coupling the ancillas to a bath. This is something, for instance, they do here at Alto University mm -hmm. because they actually have in the lab of some resistors or they can engineer a cold environment, as you're saying, to initialize the ancilla. And of course they can play on the speed limit and try to make it fast. But what they do in IBM is that you, you don't have uh, the freedom of getting a cold environment on some ancillas only. So what you can do to initialize the ancillas is you start in the ground state because it's, it's what they give you. It's what they give you, basically. And if you want a, a specific state, then you can just apply a single qubit gate on the state of the ancilla and get to that state if you want a, a pure state. And that is just very fast because the, the gates are just very fast in this, way, in this sense. If you want a thermal state, then it's more complex. But my suggestion is 
if you want a thermal state, then you can think of it as a, as a um, not a superposition, as a linear combination of pure states, right? A incoherent linear combination of pure states. So it's just an average over pure states. So what you can do is start for, is to start from, for instance, from zero or from one with a certain rate given by the temperature of your, your thermal state. And then you do something which can be thought of as a quantum trajectory. So you do your dynamics with zero and then you, your dynamics with one and when, then again with zero with some Monte Carlo sampling and then you average over these dynamics to, to, to get a proper simulation. And of course you can do this and I think it's practical. You can, you can implement it without problems, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll, I will later uh, later ask you more. Thing. I'm very curious <laughs> about <Okay>. setups. <laughs> also, Marco will be here soon. Yeah, I will. Ah, cool. So, yeah. And uh, there Great. was another question also from Emilio. Mm -hmm. You are muted. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, I have a question. Can you model the noise you see in the in the experiments? I mean, can you? Uh, I understand that the noise comes from interactions with the with the environment, with the with the room where the computer is, and all that. Can you? Is there any way to to extract the properties of, the, of this noise and then to represent them as additional terms in your dissipative quantum equation? Is this possible? To, to so exactly to know what is the system you are, uh, you, are you are simulating in this computer? Of course, this is somehow the saint graal of, uh, of uh, experimental quantum computation because the, the, the problem is there, right? But there is noise, but you, you are not really sure about what is the physical source of this noise. But so let's say there are different noise models, physical no noise models, literally like get into the condensed matter uh, components of uh, your chip. And so to try to understand what is, get, what is the noise arising there. And of course, um, the fact that uh, quantum computers uh, are becoming way more, more and more efficient in the past few years is due to the fact that people are trying, are, are uh, like managing to understand what is the major source of noise. And so they're trying to engineer some different chips, some different superconducting qubits, which just avoid those sources of noise. But like to have a, um, a general Hamiltonian model of your qubit and the noise, I think that is something very difficult and nobody really did it so far. But what I can say is that in our, in our work, we try to do something in that direction. Of course, it's not Hamiltonian, it's not a, a continuous uh, time evolution, but we do, if you want, a discrete description of the noise because for each, time step for each gate we've used, we get uh, what I call the, uh, the full process tomography of the grid. And this is a term from quantum information and it means that you, you are really describing, you are doing the most general description of what is happening on, on your gate. So if you want, it's not a Hamiltonian model, but if you think of your gate as something discrete that you apply as a black box, as a quantum operation, then what we have done experimentally is exactly to characterize this uh, black box. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, um, and as I shown, this is already giving a lot of, uh, a lot of details about what is happening on the platform. You see what are the faulty gates, uh, you see if the source of noise is dissipative or, or coherent. Uh, so I think it's uh, quite a step forward, but to get a Hamiltonian description of that, of course it's, very difficult, maybe not even clear if you if, if you can do it efficiently. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. I think there were some hands raised. Yeah. Uh, hi, Marco. Can you hear me? Uh, a bit louder, maybe. I uh, wait. Now. You hear me? Wait. In the, in the okay, yeah, I'm just raising the volume. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the trotterization that you use for the simulation because you, mm -hmm. you have used the second order trotter formula. Mm -hmm. And I guess that there is a trade off between the number of gates that you use for simulating the, the interaction between the ANSILA and the, and the qubits. 
So did you try to use different trotter formulas to try to improve the, the error of the simulations or of the, of the quantum computation? Mm, uh, let's say that to simulate collective effects, this is the best you can do. Because if you don't have a second order, you get to a first order, so you just have a, a single gate, then you cannot simulate collective effects anymore. But can you, can't you use the fourth order formula, for example? You can use the fourth order formula and what it means if you use fourth order formula. It means that you have way more gates, but you, have a, um, you can use a, a smaller time step, right? Mm -hmm. um, do we agree on this? Because if you have fourth order, it means that you just have to decompose this uh, more times, right? So you have a gate and then another gate and then another gate, something like that. Am I wrong or? Yeah, there, there is an explicit formula somewhere. Yeah, yeah, there, there is a formula, but the idea is in general that you are adding more gates, right? More single bricks of your uh, yeah, algorithm. But, but the error of the simulation is smaller, so do you- The error, like... exactly. The, the error given by delta t, right? Mm -hmm. So in principle, you can, uh, you can choose a, a better delta t. But anyway, um, the message is, uh, that's an interesting point, but what I didn't show you, and now we'll try to get it some, ah, no. Wait, you see Mendeley, right? Mm -hmm. The error coming from the delta t, which is uh, finite, is very small. So um, if you see this plot I've shown you before, here there is this inset, and this inset is the error for the ideal, the ideal error, not the noisy error, for using a finite uh, delta t, which is not uh, infinitesimal. And the error is very, very, like even for 10 collisions, is very, very small. So the order of 10 to the minus uh, one, okay? While our experimental error, which if I manage to show you, um, our experimental error after five collision is already uh, here. Like it's this, uh, if you want this uh, um, red line here. So it's um, one or two orders of magnitude more. So like the message is the error it, you get from using more gates and the gates are noisy and dissipative is way worse than the error uh, due to the fact that you're using a small but finite delta t. So if you use a fourth order formula, you just get uh, even, even worse results. Uh, why did you say that you cannot use the first order formula? First or fourth? No, first. No, no, uh, first, I, I first it's, um, it's, um, it's a problem due to the fact that you want to, to have something collective. If you want to have something collective uh, uh, and you have one ancilla, um, you need to use this trotterization. Oh, this okay. is the result of, uh, of our paper last year, basically. Oh. Before everybody was just using the first order, but with the first order, you just cannot have uh, collective effects there. If you use uh, the second order, you can, um, you can engineer these effects, but otherwise you cannot. Thank you. Okay. So we are a bit late. I think we should uh, stop here, but with the idea uh, that uh, Marco will be soon uh, visiting Casa di Fisk and we will probably have a meeting for interested people, a quantum meeting which we can discuss, continue to discuss these things. Okay. Okay, Marco. Thank you very much for the talk. Also Thanks. for having the talk just uh, in a very <laughs> busy period as you are moving. And uh, thank you, and see you soon. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.